Hello, this is Arkeem Ra. I'm here with Disclosure now with our special guest, Emmy Lee. Emmy Lee is a targeted individual, and she also has connections, uh, interesting connections in her family. Her father was uh, Robert Dunham, who was uh, had military connections, was stationed in Jap uh, Japan, and uh, was involved in cult movies and all sorts of uh, psychic phenomenon and all sorts of really interesting things. And I'm sure it's all connected in some way. Um, so welcome to the show, Emmy. Thank you for having the courage to step forward and tell your story. Well, thank you, Arkeem, for having me. I'm I'm really excited to be here. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're on the show. Um, so for those of the viewers who aren't aware, what is a targeted individual? Well, um, I had heard the term probably about five or six years ago, and I had never heard the term before. Um, I had heard of the term uh, gang stalking, um, but not really as far as targeted individuals. I've heard it in um, used in other other ways, like police targeting uh, people and stuff like that. And I'm actually targeted by the police as well as uh, the feds. Um, and the reason for that is because... <sighs> I was married to a police officer um, in Massachusetts for 13 years, but halfway into the marriage, um, he got a job with the NSA at the National Security Agency at Fort Meade as an SPO, special police officer. Now we moved from Pennsylvania, um, I'm sorry, Massachusetts to Pennsylvania um, to a place called York, Pennsylvania. It's about an hour uh, north of Baltimore City, Maryland, so that he could commute to work to go to the NSA. Now, my ex-husband was a very abusive man. He was in Desert Storm. And uh, when we met, uh, he was not, not all there. <laughs> so um, it's kind of a difficult story to tell because I was in involved in a lot of domestic violence. And he threatened me with guns and, you know, scared my children. And I ended up having two children with him. And so I have four children altogether, uh, another child that I was forced to give up for adoption at 16. Um, so I've been through a lot of trauma in my life. And the first time I heard the word narcissistic abuse, it was like he his picture should have been there under the term because I was like, this explains everything that I've been going through for a very long time. And so um, I left him three years into his position at, at the NSA. And I had gotten a restraining order against him, what they call a PFA protection from abuse order in the state of Pennsylvania. So because he could not carry a gun, because when you have a restraining order, they take your gun away and then they take all your guns away. He could not carry a gun on the job. So he had to be suspended. Then in March, 2008, um, I was contacted by the NSA because I gave them information about some nefarious activities he was doing because we owned a military tactical and police supply business uh, from September of 1999 until about February 2008, right before I left him. And so I had to leave the, the marital home with my four kids and go to a domestic violence shelter. And I had uh, some of my kids' teachers helping me out um, to escape, you know, safely because he was very violent and he was constantly, you know, threatening me with guns and things like that. So um, he started calling the shelter. He found out where I was. So the people that worked at the shelter were very concerned for my safety as well as the safety of my children initially. So they had me lock my phone in a lead box. They even had a picture of him at the shelter. Like, this is what this guy looks like in case, you know, he comes here and tries to kill me. And he had threatened to kill me numerous times before. Now, four years ago, um, I became homeless for four months in the wintertime, and I had discovered that my ex-boyfriend was communicating with my ex-husband, and so he kicked me out after I called the police and he assaulted me, and so they said that I wasn't allowed to stay there anymore, but yet I had been with this man for 12 years. And we had been in a relationship. We'd lived together for six years. And I never had a reason to uh, suspect that he was monitoring me or, you know, keeping tabs on me for my ex-husband until one day um, I happened to see his phone. And that's when I started 
finding out that they'd been messing each other, messaging each other back and forth. Why? I don't know. And so the only thing I can think of is that um, at one point in time, my ex-husband, he was targeting all my friends, anybody that tried to help me, whether it be my therapist, my doctors, my, um, you know, my boyfriend, friends, especially if they were male, um, he would harass them, he would threaten them. And everyone was so afraid of him that they didn't want to call the police. So he's had me arrested over 20 times in three different states over the last 20 years. Um, I've been arrested from everything from five counts of criminal harassment, misuse of a telephone, misuse of a telecommunications device, following a false police report. And this all started back when he was a police officer in Massachusetts. So the, the police started targeting me because I originally got a restraining order in October of 2003 when my youngest daughter was, uh, well, it was like a couple weeks before her second birthday. And I had filed a restraining order for him, you know, against him for domestic violence. I had to actually go to a different police department because I couldn't go to his police department because they wouldn't help me. And so um, after I was going through all this stuff um, and I got the restraining order, literally like the day or two after I got a knock on the door from the police, I had child protective services at my door and they were taking my kids, all of them. They took all my kids and and they put them in foster care. I'm so sorry. They said that I was crazy and that I had, um, I was delusional. They claimed that I had post-traumatic stress, um, not post-traumatic stress disorder. They said that I had um, postpartum psychosis. And right around that time was when that woman, Andrea Yates, had killed her five kids in Texas and drowned them in a bathtub. But my daughter was almost two years old. And it was right after I took the restraining order out. So obviously... It was a retaliation for taking out the restraining order. So then I, well, prior, just, just the day before all this happened, I had gone to the police department and spoke with this uh, lieutenant. And I'll name him because I don't care. He's the chief of police now. His name is Edward Walsh. And I think he was might have been either lieutenant or captain at that time. And so I went down to the police department. I brought my children and they were almost two. One was almost five. One was almost nine. And my oldest was almost 14. Now, during all of this stuff that was going on, my oldest son's father was dying of cancer. So I had gone to the police department. I spoke to this captain. I said, I want to speak to an OIC, which means officer, officer in charge. He came out and I said, you know, I'm having issues with your police officers coming to my house and knocking on the door and harassing me, you know, calling my number, harassing me, asking me like, like, why is there a, a, a car in your yard with a, with main plates? Somebody shot out my car windows with a BB gun. And so I had to get a rental car. So the rental car had main plates. So the police were calling me from his apartment, although I lived in another jurisdiction, asking me why I had a car in my, in my yard, in my driveway with different plates. And I said, it's none of your business. So they kept coming to my house. And then at the last straw was when they came to my house at two o'clock in the morning, banging on the door and telling me that they got a call from my psychiatrist that I was suicidal. And I said, well, I was asleep. So obviously I didn't talk to anybody. I don't know what you're talking about. And they just laughed and like walked back to their cruisers. So the next day is when I went to complain about the police to the police and first the guy said it's not you know it's not my jurisdiction and i said okay but they're your officers so it is your problem and i said you know i have a restraining order against my ex-husband he's a cop here and he goes i don't know who your husband is and i said that's not true because i've met you at numerous police functions and you know who i am and he acted like he didn't know me so i said are you going to help me or not and he said no i'm not helping you so i said fine whatever and i proceeded to leave. I'd only talked to him for probably like six, seven minutes. And then um, I muttered effing a-hole like under my breath to him. And he's like, what did you say to me? And I said, nothing. So I proceeded to leave the police station and I had left my kids in the car, but my oldest was almost 14. So he was babysitting the kids for while well, I was in the station. So he comes out and he goes, come back here. And I was like, 
well, what is he talking about? He just said he wasn't going to help me. So why is he telling me to come back to the police station? So I just started like walking faster to my car and my car was parked on the other side of the police station. So this is how all this targeting stuff happened. It started to occur. Um, and it's, it's their, their police department is so corrupt. It's not even funny. And I had gone to their police department numerous times to report my own husband committing crimes and 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 stealing from drug dealers uh stealing stuff from the evidence room he had stolen all the mug shots of the prostitutes in the town and then kept them in a photo album in his in his police bag in his tr in his car and i'm sitting here like what like what what is this all about i mean he's not all there and so um he got suspended um he couldn't work with the gun. So they had him, you know, answering phones or and doing dispatch. And uh, all the while, the cops were just continuing to harass me, call me, um, you know, crank call me all day, all night. And I actually had to leave um, my house. I had to go uh, somewhere else to go stay because they were harassing me so much. And uh you know, I had gone to court. Um, and, oh, and so what I was saying was the guy was chasing me. He started chasing me, this cop. Um, so I ran and I, I tried to get in my car and my kids were in the car and I got into my seat. I had my hand on the, my left hand on the steering wheel. He slapped the cuffs on it and started dragging me out of the vehicle with the one cuff and I was fighting him and he was a lot bigger than me. So he slammed me down against a vehicle next to my car and I had a, a minivan. And so um, my kids were screaming. I was screaming like, help, help. But, you know, well, how, they, how are they going to help me? They're just kids. And so I said, I'm going to sue you. I said, you better have a homestead act on your house because I'm going to sue you for police brutality and all this other stuff. And so he dragged me and got my other arm, handcuffed me and dragged me to the back of the police station, put me in. Um, brought me into the station and then handcuffed me to this like pole thing and all the cops were like oh my god it's emmy what what what's going on why why are you under arrest like what's going on and i and then one guy said Shh, don't say anything you know like he was trying to help me because i do have some friends still on the police department you know and they weren't all for that corruption but they can't say anything you know so i started getting phone calls from one of the good cops giving me information about what was really going on at the police department. And he said, they're look, they're looking at firing your ex-husband. They're calling him a fruit loop and a loose cannon and a wing nut. And, you know, he, he had gone to my wedding, this guy. So I knew him, you know, outside the police department, he was my ex's friend on the department, but he was helping me out. And so um, we were communicating back and forth on the phone about what was going on at the police department. Well, come to find out, uh, the police department was listening to our phone conversations and he stopped talking to me and I had no idea why. And I had called him numerous times. He wouldn't answer. So I got a friend of mine to call and say, what's going on? Like you were talking to Emmy and you're, you know, helping her out or whatever. And now you're not talking to her. Well, several days later, I got a, ma a letter in the mail from him saying that um, I'd gone to, down to the police department for my shift and everybody was talking about us saying that we were having an affair and that's why I left my husband. And I said, what? Like, that is totally not true. Like, this guy was just a friend and I knew him from, like, meeting my ex-husband and he was his friend on the police department. Not, you know, there was nothing going on. And so he's like, I can't talk to you anymore. So... A police department is supposed to have a warrant to listen to your phone conversations. It's, it's very hard to get a warrant to listen to people's phone conversations because usually you have to be involved in organized crime or something like that. You know, something major, not just, oh, let's see what Patrick's wife is doing or who she talking to or why is she, you know, and why are they so concerned with what I'm doing? You know, if I'm leaving my husband and, and for domestic violence, what are they what are they worried about? And so I hired a lawyer and it turned out that he got like this redacted um, report from Child Protective Services, which they call DSS, Department of Social Services in Attleboro, Massachusetts, because this happened in Taunton, Massachusetts. And um, so I saw the redacted CPS report. And it's all like blacked out, you know, so you can't see the people's names. 
but pretty much my lawyer said that most of the people that reported me for neglecting my children, they could, they never said I abused my children. They said I neglected them by being mentally ill and suffering domestic violence. So, um, they said that the police called the police called and reported me for leaving my kids in the car, but yet they're the ones that left them in the car in the first place. So I started getting really targeted bad because I went to the media and I had gone to court w with that, that captain guy and he never showed up. So they dismissed the charge. They dismissed everything. And he had me arrested for disturbing the peace and disorderly conduct. And I was like, how could I have disturbed the peace inside the police station? It's a police station. And so he said I was disturbing the residents of the nursing home next door. I'm like, how? I mean, how did I do that? But it was a BS story, so they dismissed it. So one of the uh, court officers noticed that I was constantly going to court. And he's like, what's the story? And I told him what the story was, you know, what's going on? The police are harassing me. And he goes, why don't you go to the newspapers? Give them your side of the story. So I did. And so the next day after I spoke to this uh, guy from the Taunton Daily Gazette by the name of Scott Dolan was the reporter, I believe. Uh, he no longer works there, but he interviewed me. He came to my house. I gave him my side of the story as far as why my children were in foster care and the whole thing about the police. And so the headline of the Taunton Daily Gazette back in October 2003 was cop's wife gets arrested one day after taking out restraining order. Now, all those stories were in Google. You could, you know, you could look all these stories up with my name and everything. When my ex-husband got that job with the NSA, it's all scrubbed off the internet. Now you can't find it. It's all gone. I mean, there, there was all information about my, me. My, my name was blasted all over Google and different, you know, different newspapers. I got even uh, Fox News in Denham, Massachusetts calling me like we want an interview. So I interviewed with Fox News and they blanked out my face and everything. But then my lawyer was like, no, we're not going to put you on the news because you're going to be targeted even more by the police and you're already targeted. So it cost me a lot of money to get my kids back. Um, took me seven months. They made me go through the ringer. I had counselors coming to my house. I had to have a forensic evaluation. Um, I had to go through parenting classes, like all for nothing. And at the very end of it, my son's dad died of cancer in February 11th of 2004. He was 34. He had stage four Hodgkin's. So my son had gone, had to go through all this trauma of watching his father die and then meanwhile, the police are targeting us, throws him in foster care and, you know, all the kids are separated. And, and then my ex-mother-in-law got custody of my two youngest kids. And so after seven months and my son's dad died, I finally got all my kids back. But they said, well, you know, you, we think that maybe you should drop the restraining order. And so because I was so harassed um, and, and getting so targeted and, and, and I had cops calling me saying like, well, you know, if you divorce him, you could lose everything. You already lost your kids. You know, like if you drop the restraining order and just say that all this stuff was made up, they will just make it all go away. And so the people involved in that corruption was U S representative James Fagan and his partner, Frederick Chirigotis of Taunton, Massachusetts. That's who my ex-husband hired as his divorce lawyer. And so I was asked to, after I fired my lawyer for kind of screwing with my case, um, and his name was Brad Greenberg of Brockton, Massachusetts. Later, I had Mark Griffith of Cambridge, and he was excellent. But excuse me. Um, so Frederick Chirigotis made me go to his office. And because I graduated from Suffolk University in Boston with my bachelor's degree in mass communications with a minor in sports broadcasting, I used to intern at New England Sports Network in Boston. I, I was Debbie Robleski, the sports reporter's personal assistant. I worked on the show Front Row. I was going places. I went to graduate school. I got into law school. And that's when I met this guy and... My whole life just started going down the drain. He didn't want me to go to grad school. He didn't want me to go to law school. He wanted to tell me what to do with my life. And now, you know, 
he, and, and also he had this preconceived notion about Asian women because he was in the Marines, he was stationed in Okinawa and he would say, well, why don't you tell everyone you're from Okinawa and I bought you, brought you back from when I was in the Marines. I'm like, well, I was born in Tokyo, but I came to the United States in 1975 when I was almost six years old. I'm an American. I'm not one of those subservient concubine type women. And that's, I guess what he wanted. And I wasn't like that. So, you know, he's, he's put me and my children through unimaginable trauma and the police never did anything. He shot a gun in the house, right? We were married on September 11th of 1999. He picked 9-11 as our wedding date because he was a cop. And then two years later was the World Trade Center tragedy. And um, that right after, because my dad ended up dying that year and I was pregnant. So I was nine months pregnant during September 11th. I was working for Verizon in Boston at 185 Franklin Street, 11th floor for TSOC, which is Telecommunication Industry Service Operations Center. So I was writing like codes and stuff for Verizon to bring long distance to Verizon. And we were, I was like working... Um, like leasing our lines to wholesale marketing companies, uh, like other phone companies, so that they could break into long distance so that there wouldn't be a monopoly. And so I started at Bell Atlantic, and then we ended up changing in January 2000 to Verizon. Um, so I was, you know, working a job, making a lo lot of money, and um, he just started going nutso. And my dad died August 6, 2001. He was found dead in Sarasota, Florida after he was working for Whack and Hut Security. Now, I don't know if a lot of people might not know what Whack and Hut Security is, but a couple of years after uh, he passed away, it was bought out by British intelligence. And they hire a lot of ex, you know, CIA or... Uh, people that worked overseas and it's all connected to the to target individual stuff. Right. Right. Because, um, and I know this is a little scary, but the, I ended up meeting a lot of people like me in the last five or six years, you know, becoming friends with other targeted individuals and comparing notes. And there's some people that have gone through the same kind of thing as I went through. But then when they started talking about things like energy weapons and do and voice to skull, V2K, all that, I was, I wasn't sure what to believe because I didn't think I went through that kind of thing. So your um, experience is a bit different than that. Yeah. But the thing of it is, is that when they, I suffer from a bunch of just very weird medical conditions, um, my mother was Japanese, Russian, and Mongolian. My dad was English, Scottish, and Irish. So my dad was O positive. I'm O positive. My mom is, I believe, B negative. So I was an RH factor baby, and I was born in 1969 in Setagaya, Tokyo, Japan. So at that time, they didn't have, you know, the the antidote or whatever for that RH thing. So my mom ended up having um, toxemia, which is now called preeclampsia. And so I was born premature. I was born with a congenital hip dislocation. Um, I have spina bifida occulta, so I'm missing my L4 vertebrae. I have scoliosis. They told her that I'd probably be crippled, blind, deaf, maybe retarded. And uh, they basically had no hope that I would even live. And I was in an incubator for like two months. So my father at that time was filming Godzilla versus Megalon at that time. Actually, I'm sorry. That's not true. That was 1974. Um, okay. I'm sorry. I'm getting it mixed up, but he was in working in the, in the movie industry in Japan. And so when I was in the hospital and I was getting blood transfusions, why I don't know, but they had me go through like two years of blood transfusions. Um, and I remember them because Back in the day, they didn't have like those plastic bags, you know, for the IV. They had glass jars. And I just remember, you know, remember that. And then I remember like them having like two different ones and one would be taking the blood, one would be removing the blood and it would be going through like this machine, which I later found out was like hemodialysis machine. And so I never really got the full story about what 
was wrong with me or I never got like any kind of like medical term or anything. So when I asked my mother, she said she doesn't remember. When I asked my father when he was alive, he said, well, I don't know what the name of it is in English. And so they never told me, but I do suffer from lupus and another autoimmune disease, but I also have Ehlers-Danlos, uh, which is a, EDS is a connective tissue disease that causes joints to, you know, dislocate. I have like really, really smooth skin. That's probably why I look young. Um, I don't have fingerprints. Um, when I've been arrested so many times in three different states, they can't get my, they can't get my fingerprints. And, you know, sometimes I'm like, hmm, like, what is, like, you know, it sounds like something out of a movie, like my dad burned off, burned off my fingerprints. But the thing of it is, too, that's really weird is my dad changed my name three times before I was 13. So really? my name now is not even the name that, that I was born with. Um, when I was 21 years old, I changed, legally changed my whole name to Emiko Jade Frost. And I chose Frost because... That was my son's dad's last name, the one that had died of cancer and his family, you know, thought we were going to get married and we had a child together. And so I changed my last name to him. Jade is just an Asian sounding name. And Emiko was actually uh, my best friend in kindergarten in Japan. In Dayan Chofu, I went to a, a Catholic kindergarten. Um, it was run by two Franciscan monks and then all the rest of the nuns were Japanese. And it was a school in Dayan Chofu, and Dayan Chofu is kind of like the Beverly Hills of Tokyo, where all the famous actors and kids or famous baseball players' kids, like, we all went to the school together. And um, I'm still friends with somebody I went to kindergarten with to this day. It's crazy. He's on my Facebook. <laughs> but um, my father, you know, in 1966, he made a soft disclosure movie called The Time Travelers with actress Linda Pearl. Now, Linda Pearl, she, um, you know, I'm a little older than a lot of these people. I'll be 54 in October. And Linda Pearl, it's P-U-R-L. She was married to Desi Arnaz Jr., who is the son of Lucille Ball from the I Love Lucy show and Desi Arnaz Sr. Sometimes she even does cabaret shows with him because um, she's also a singer. So she lived in Japan and she went to this like Toho something Academy or something like that. And her, and she speaks uh, fluent Japanese. And so my dad made a movie with her um, called the time travelers. And it was uh, produced by Cliff Harrington. And my father wrote the movie, directed the movie and starred in the movie with Linda Pearl's mother. And now it was a very unusual black and white movie, similar to like a twilight zone kind of movie. That's the, the way it was set up. And usually movies are like an hour and a half these days, hour and a half or more. It, this movie was like an odd, it was like an odd time, like, like six, not like less than 60 minutes or it was like 45 minutes or something like that. It was really short. And my father played a military man by the name of Mr. Farrington and that he was on leave or something like that. Um, and, and he was, you know, married with this this daughter and he just started noticing like something was wrong in the town and like everybody disappeared and he had been going to work like he'd been he got a call from the army base like come come to the army base we're having some kind of problem and then he um went there but before he was like looking at a comic strip of like like if you ever saw um back to the future uh the the first one where uh, Michael J. Fox character is like showing that guy the comic book about the spaceman. Well, literally, my father is like holding this comic book about like space about something to do with the spaceman. And there's like a spaceman on the cover of it in the movie. And then later, I think he like kills his family. And then there's like clones. And then he's like burying the family like you know in the backyard. And um, and now there's like this replacement family that comes. And they look just like the old family. So, you know, I mean, I watched it since I was a little kid and I never really thought anything of it because my dad used to have it on a 16 millimeter reel to reel so that we would play it like as a home movie on like a big movie screen at home. And um, so Linda Pearl now, um, you know, she was in The Office. She played Pam Beasley's mom. She was in Homeland um, on Showtime with uh, Claire Dane and uh, Mandy Packinson. Um, she was also on Happy Days with uh, Fonzie. She played his girlfriend and the girl from Poltergeist. 
um, the little blonde girl, Heather O'Rourke, you know, and there's a lot of talk about Heather O'Rourke and how she passed and stuff about Steven Spielberg. And, um, you know, he, she, she was on that show, but she made movies in Japan as well. The other guy that made movies with my dad was Mark Lester. Now, Mark Lester was a British child actor. He was uh, in the original Oliver, like the Oliver twist by Charles Dickens in that movie. He played Oliver. Now, Mark Lester was, um, he's now a, a, a osteopathic doctor and an acupuncturist in England. But he's also the godfather of all of Michael Jackson's kids. And several years, well, after Michael Jackson died, he came out and said that he was actually Paris Jackson's father. And it was all over the, you know, like National Enquirer and the Sun and all these things. And people just dismissed it like, what, like he's crazy. Um, and he was saying how the Jackson family wouldn't let him see the kids. And he had this relationship with like Prince and Paris and Blanket and what I don't remember. I don't even remember like the names of the, if there was even more kids or not. But um, so, you know, it, it's just unusual because back in Japan, child pornography was legal until 1999. And so there was rumors that um, Mark Lester had been, had appeared nude in um, some movies with adults. And he did. I mean, you can Google it. It's right there. Uh, and, and, you know, when I Googled it one time, I was like, wait a minute, like, you know, I don't want to be caught with, you know, looking something up that I'm not supposed to, but it was like, it was, it was just there. And I'm like, wow, like they still have this up on Google. Like they're okay with this, but you know, and so the part about myself and being an SRA survivor of satanic ritualistic abuse, this occurred on Cape Cod, Massachusetts, where my father moved me when I was, you know, a few months short of my sixth birthday. And we ended up renting this house in Truro, Massachusetts. Now Truro is kind of an unusual area of Cape Cod. It's it's right next to the tip of Cape Cod, next to Provincetown. And there's a lot of UFO activity. In fact, in Men in Black 2, you see Tommy Lee Jones at the Truro post office, you know, with all the aliens and everything. And um, I don't really want to say too much because my family uh, doesn't want me to talk about this. But just um, I can just say that my one of my children's family members used to be on unsolved mysteries talking about ufos and uh you know it, it's it's a lot of this stuff is just new to me um and as far as the secret space program the first time i ever heard that term was when i lived in pennsylvania and i when i was in a relationship with this guy who was kind of like a conspiracy theory nut. I won't say his name because I know he said if I ever mention his name, he's going to sue me. Um, but his father-in-law worked for the NSA. So when I first started dating him and I said, well, I'm getting a divorce from someone from the NSA, he's like, oh, I'm getting a divorce from the daughter of a, someone from the NSA in the secret space program. And I'm like, the what? Like, I didn't know any of this. And then um, I just had this sort of inkling that my father was involved in the CIA because when he passed away and even before he passed away, um, I had the notion to steal this scrapbook from my father's collection. And, uh, I was 13 years old and I held on to it until 2019. So from Let's see, uh, third, so I was 1983 or 84 until 2019. I had this scrapbook and I never really looked at it. I just had it in my possession. And then after my father died, I started looking into it. And that's when, you know, I sent you those articles where he literally kept a scrapbook of all of his activities overseas, including spying. There was one story that said U.S. businessman uncovers red spy ring here. There was other stuff about him in, being involved in uh, this false flag event at the uh, parliament building in the diet section of Japan in Fukuoka. Now, because my ex-husband works for the NSA, I know the Fukuoka is one of their satellite offices, in addition to Paris, Panama City, um, I think Frankfurt, Germany, um, 
you know, they have offices overseas pretty much in every country, every major country. London, that's another one. And London is one of the most heavily targeted areas because they have the most video cameras. And so speaking of London, I wanted to bring up my friend, um, Phil Leak. Now, Phil was a targeted individual who taught me a lot about what TI, what that means. He has a YouTube channel. It's under Phil Leak, L-E-E-K. He's deceased now. Now, I had been talking to him about what's going on with the NSA, and he had actually been interviewed for some kind of documentary over, over in England, and he lived close to Hull, I think. I can't remember this specific town, um, but he started making videos of getting targeted by the police, and they were saying he was schizophrenic, paranoid schizophrenic. Uh, they were saying he was a meth addict, uh, alcoholic, you know, all this other stuff. And he would come home and videotape like how they beat him up. And he, he, his whole face would be messed up. I mean, anybody could look at the, the channel it's there. And he's, you know, he would talk about, Oh, they're putting me in the mental institution again. They're saying that I'm need help. I'm, I'm crazy. This and that and the other thing. And if you really listen to the stuff he says and the drawings he makes, cause he was an artist, it's, you know, I mean, I had to go back and watch some of this stuff after he passed away because I was the last person to talk to him. We wow. had been talking. Yeah, I we had been talking for several years because after I found him on YouTube, because I just like put in the search bar, like targeted individual and his channel came up. And so I started watching it and I'm like, wow, this is crazy. Like This is the same stuff I'm going through. And so I sent him a friend, I looked up him up on Facebook and sent him a friend request. And we just started talking and comparing notes. And in 2019, I was stabbed in the face right here. It's not as bad as it is now because I have it covered by makeup. But um, when I was homeless, I was targeted really bad, really bad. I mean, I was beat up. I was raped. I was kidnapped. I had a guy hold a gun to me and, and take me to Baltimore City, rob me and make me go out on drug deals. And, um, and so I had luckily found somebody that was like protecting me on the streets. But now he moved out to Los Angeles. I told him not to go there and he had lived there before working for one of the movie studios as a security guard. And so, um, in the last 18 months, he's been arrested 18 months. I mean, 18 times and he's a targeted individual. And so now he's in the twin, twin towers, twin towers, like twin towers, like the world trade center, twin towers, prison in Los Angeles with his revo bail revoked. And I can't even talk to him. But the other, the other thing with, uh, Phil is, um, I had given him information about the NSA and, uh, he was in good spirits. Like he was like, I'll talk to you tomorrow. And then he didn't message me. And I was like, hello, like what's going on? Like you didn't message me. And then I went on his Facebook and it said, rest in peace. And he's not the first one. There was another targeted individual. We were all friends. Like we're all in the same group of TIs that were communicating. And I had another friend. His name was Mario Leonardo Elizondo from Miami. And he was actually from, I think, Michigan. And he was a DJ in Miami. And he was a targeted individual. So he actually wrote a letter to President Trump stating that, can you please stop the gang stalking program? And he actually got a letter back. And he posted it to his Facebook, which is under Mario Leonardo. And he uh, was a DJ. He traveled all over the place, you know, doing his DJ stuff. And he was under Bass Prada, B-A-S-S-P-R-A-D-A -S 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 on uh, YouTube. It's, it's his music is still there. And uh, same thing. I talked to him about the NSA. Um, he told me he was writing a letter to the NSA uh, to tell them to leave him alone. And he said he the last thing he said to me was maybe uh, maybe I should get a job there. Maybe if I got a job there, they'd leave me alone. Then uh, he was found dead. 26 years old. They said it was a heart attack. And this is way before COVID. This was like right before COVID started. 
And um, there's been somebody hacking his Facebook and writing that it's him, that he's still alive and all this stuff. And, and we know, we just don't know. There's only one article in Go on Google where someone had, um, I guess he had a will. So there's something about a will and, um, you know, spending money towards a will. Like they have to keep like, you know, records of everything, you know, a couple of, as far as his estate or something like that. But, um, you know, it's, it's kind of scary. It's kind of scary. And then, you know, I, I know a lot of other people, you know, they're getting shot at, uh, they're, they're, you know, they're the same thing. Their windows are getting shot out. There's bullet holes in their car, bullet holes in their, in their, um, boats. Um, they're getting chased around, followed, intimidated, you know, and all that stuff has been happening to me for 20 years and nobody believed me. Nobody believed me. They were like, you're crazy. You're nobody's following you. What are you talking about? You, you must be paranoid. Maybe there's something wrong with you. Maybe you belong in a mental institution. And it got to the point where it was so bad that, I mean, I almost was beginning to believe what they were saying that, that it's all me that I'm, I'm maybe I'm just imagining all this stuff. And that's exactly what my family was doing because my family was sexually abusing me and forcing me into child pornography. And my father owned an import export business in Fukuoka called Pan Commercial Limited. And he also owned a publishing company. He owned a shoe company. He owned all these fronts for overseas activities. And, um, one of my, uh, one of the actors that was in two movies with my dad, Tom Korzanowski, he was in A Flight from Mashiach, which my dad had a very, very tiny part in that movie. He made like $5,000 for like 10 minutes of being in the movie. And that was with Yul Brenner and Richard Widmark. Richard Widmark was in the West Side Story with Natalie Wood. The original West Side Story he played one of the Jets, but he's not as well known as Yul Brenner. And my dad also made other, you know, war movies like Marines Let's Go. Then he made Dogara the Space Monster, where he was played the role of Mark Jackson, which is like a, he was like a diamond thief or something. And it had to do with aliens and all that kind of stuff. He was also in Godzilla vs. Megalon, Mothra, the, um, the Mothra, um, the Green Slime. That's another one. And so, you know, when you look back into the stuff that my father was was involved in, the secret space program, when I looked up his name in the CIA.gov website and put in Robert Dean Dunham in the search bar, all of a sudden it pulled up something about psychic phenomenon. And I'm like, what is this about? So I read the article. I didn't understand the article. And then at the very end of the article, it stated you know, Robert Dean Dunham was a foreign correspondent between like 1953 and 1975 or something like that, which is exactly the time that he was in Japan. Now, when my father died, somebody already cremated my father. They already put a um, obituary in the, in the Cape Cod or newspaper um, back home in Cape Cod, Massachusetts, but they put my birth name in there. So, and then they didn't even say that he was a movie actor. They didn't say any, all they said was, you know, that he worked uh, for the town of Cape, of this town in Cape Cod uh, in Truro uh, because he was a harbor master at one point in time because my grandfather owned a boat marina and a Pontiac dealership in Needham, Massachusetts. And pretty much everybody that my father, you know, his whole family, they, they would call them wasps, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, you know, elite, rich, you know, I'm related to George W. Bush is my 10th cousin. Obama's my 21st cousin. And Dunham is my maiden name. Obama's mom's name was Stanley Ann Dunham. And, uh, and then, you know, you hear things about like, oh, George Bush is related to the royal family. And so I started doing research. And I know a lot of people said, don't give your DNA, you know, don't take the DNA test, don't do ancestry, you know. But I was like, I was at a point in my life where I was... I was like, you know what? I don't even care if they have my DNA, whatever. So I went ahead and did the DNA test. I uploaded it to this website I found. And then it started like pulling up all these relations to people. And when I went on this website, my whole fa father's side of the family was already on this website. Now, at one point in time, I practiced Mormonism <laughs> and, um, I had a friend from high school who, you know, thought that they could really help me. 
And so I went to the Mormon church and uh, became a Mormon for four months. And it was a little interesting, but, you know, the Mormons actually have the biggest library of family history and genealogy in Salt Lake City, Utah. And so I uploaded a lot of my family history into their library through the uh, Jesus Christ uh, of Latter-day Saints little like they have a little like sort of like a christian science reading room but in their church they have a little room off to the side where you can upload uh, you know your genealogy stuff so i don't know if that's how all my family stuff got onto this other website or not but you know i ended up looking at um the royal family i'm related to every single member of the royal family every single member on both sides prince you know well king charles uh, Queen Consort Camilla Parker Bowles, Diana Spencer, Prince Charles is my, uh, I mean, Prince William and Prince Harry are my 14th cousins. Um, Queen Elizabeth's my 12th cousin, like two times removed. I mean, I looked up everybody, her sister Margaret, you know, Prince Philip, Mar Meghan Markle, Catherine Middleton, Pippa. I mean, everybody. I'm related to all of them by blood. So it's it's weird. And then And then I looked up every single president. I'm related to 29 of them. And my closest relation is George W. He's my 10th cousin with nothing removed. And I know a lot of people don't understand like genealogy. Like they're like 10th cousin. Like, what does that mean? I mean, I don't really know either. I mean, I'm just started getting into this like four years ago, but it is interesting, you know, the relation to all of these elite people. And then when you look at my uh, second great grandfather, Henry Ellsworth Dean from Worcester, Massachusetts, who was a Republican, I found a picture of him on Google. It said he was a Freemason and an odd fellow. Now I have a crazy quilt that was made by my great grandmother in the 18 late 1800s. Her name was Bertha May Chadbourne. She was married to Henry Ellsworth Dean. He was a U.S. congressman. And I never knew that because my family lied to me. They said he was first. They said he was like a sheriff. Then they said he was a lawyer. Then they said he was like a warden of a jail. And come to find out, he wasn't any of those things at all. And even prior to becoming a U.S. congressman, so my grandmother was born in London, and her name was Charlotte Dean Dunham, Charlotte Grace Dean Dunham. So that's my dad's mom. And then Earl Treffrey Dunham. Treffrey, that name comes from Cornwall, England, and we actually have a Treffrey Castle in Fowey. And they have a lot of similar sounding um, towns in uh, Cornwall, like Truro and Falmouth. And, and, and those are all towns on Cape Cod. And a lot of my uh, relatives were like sea captains. And um, I come from a long line of sea captains, like on my dad's side of the family. Um, and so, you know, it, it's just interesting all the connections and then and then when you talk about like the ssp and and the project stargate when i looked up my dad's name and he was talking about that psychic you know the psychic studying psychic phenomenon and all this i'd never heard of that i've never heard this like ever mentioned in my house like growing up with my father he never mentioned any of this stuff the thing that i thought was really weird um was that my mother you know, she was Japanese and she could read Japanese and write Japanese. But my dad, even though he was fluent in Japanese because he went to correspondence school after the military, he couldn't read Japanese and he couldn't write Japanese. So sometimes he would get these transcripts sent to him. I don't, I don't know how they were sent to him, but I'd see them and they were all in Japanese. My mom would translate them for him in the dining room and they would shut all the doors, shut all the curtains and tell me and my sister to go outside and play and not come back until they were done. And I'm sitting here like, what were they talking about? And then the, the this really bizarre thing happened in 1986. Now my parents got a divorce in 1984. And at that time, my father was a raging, well, he was a raging alcoholic and he abused drugs. And my mom started doing the same kind of thing. And so they were never parents to me. Never. I mean, my parents never told me they love me. They never hugged me. They never, you know, and they were like, well, it's the Japanese way. They would say J Japanese people aren't affectionate Japanese people. But I'm like, dad, you're not Japanese. But he considered himself Japanese because he'd been there for so long. And so um, I started 
I was like a curious kid. I started investigating my own family. <laughs> and so my dad had this secret office. Um, I found the key to it. And so I would break in there with the key and look around his stuff. And especially when my parents were getting a divorce, my mom wanted me to spy on my dad. And so um, at one point in time, my mom, during the divorce, she's like, I want to get a secret phone. And this is in 1984. I was 14. So she ended up getting a secret phone line put in uh, in the dining room behind the uh, one of these cabinets that kept like all the china and everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, she had it put in when my dad wasn't home. And I'm thinking, why does she need another phone line? Like who's listening to her phone calls? And, and, and in 1984... You know, I mean, I'm, I know they were doing it because my ex-husband said that back in the day, they used to call people at the NSA that listened to your phone conversations. They called them knob turners because now everything's, you know, back then it was analog and now everything's digital and who knows what else they're, you know, what kind of technology they're into. Because he's talked about supercars. He's talked about, uh, you know, like these super um trains that go to Camp David, you know, the underground tunnels. I mean, all kinds of the supercomputers. Like he's told me things that like I knew about Clinton lo losing the nuclear codes before it was even on TV because my ex-husband told me this, but he has TS top secret clearance. And so um, when he was under investigation, uh, I forgot to mention that part when the NSA came out to speak to me because I wouldn't go to the Fort Meade and they were at 9,800 sat North Savage road in Fort Meade, Maryland, 20755. Their main number, which is on Google is 301-688-6311. And they know me on a first name basis. My ex-husband used to work for security operations command center or SOC S O C C. Um, and I infiltrated the NSA's phone line once. I mean, not infiltrated it as in like I hacked it or anything. It's just, I wanted to see how far I could get to reach the top guy at the NSA. And so I called the number. They told me to stop calling there. They're like, Emmy, stop calling. They know me on a first base basis. So then I said, all right, well then put me through to this line. And I was already talking to the NSA agent, Michael Lindsay. There was Michael Lindsay, Ken, um, Kenny Angeloff and Kimberly Tiger. Those are the three agents I dealt with, but I only met with Michael Lindsay. And so um, he wanted to meet with me to speak to me about my ex-husband because he was suspended at the time. And um, he wanted to know more about this information that I had about my ex-husband selling weapons to uh, Pakistan, Ireland, Germany, Russia, Israel, through our home business that we had, which is the military police uh, tactical supply business called S4 Supply. We had a web-based business it's called S4Supply.com. And we sold knives like Microtech, Protech, Tops knives, uh, Ken Onion, Ken, um, let's see, Reese Whelan, Steve Corkum. We, we sold like handmade custom knives that cost like thousands of dollars. We did gun shows. We did knife shows. And then he, he started selling guns, like threaded barrel guns to people in California, which is illegal because threaded barrel guns are what you attach the suppressors to. So, you know, like silencers. So uh, that's, that's, you know, class three weapons. And he also had a MAC-10 fully automatic machine gun that uh, was tested by the Massachusetts State Police Ballistics Lab. And they said it's not a fully automatic machine gun, but it is because he took the pin and slider out. So it's not considered, you know, he was in the Marines. He's a gun nut. He knows all this stuff. And so that's what I was reporting. And so um, he said, you know, when he when he wanted me to come down to the NSA and I said, no, I said, you're going to come to where I want to talk to you at. And I want to talk to you at a police department. So I set up a interview uh, with the NSA agent at the spring garden police department, uh, spring garden township police department with this detective by the name of detective Donnie Harbaugh. And the chief at the time was chief George Schwartz. Now, um, I mean, I could go all day long about the police department. My, my ex was spoofing my phone, hacking my phone, um, and then I would go to the police department and say, look, look at this. And they would see it, but they say, well, we can't do anything about it because it's a spoofed number. And so I got charged with filing a false police report, uh, out of another police department, the Spring Atsbury Township Police Department in, uh, York, Pennsylvania by, uh, Sergeant Todd King, who's now the, King, uh, now the chief of police. And, um, these people destroyed my life. 
I couldn't get a job. I worked at SCI Camp Hill in Camp Hill, Pennsylvania for the men's maximum security prison, but I worked at a region two secure facility in Harrisburg called the Harrisburg Community Correctional Center or Harrisburg CCC, which is on 28 North Cameron Street in Harrisburg. So I worked at a region two secure facility as a, originally as a security monitor and later as a correctional officer for parolees that were sex offenders and violent offenders on parole. They had me doing undercover work. They had me doing investigative work uh, with the board of parole. Um, I had a lot of power at that job where I could send somebody back to prison because they're on parole if they violate parole. And um, I loved that job. It was, it was probably one of the best jobs I had, and I was good at my job. And because I started getting arrested, then I was under investigation, then I was suspended, and, you know, eventually I lost my job, even though I quit. I was like, they fired me later on and they fired me on September 11th of 2009. I got a letter that said September 11th, of the date 2009, I was fired. And, um, Oh, what a coincidence, so, right? Right. Right. And on top of that, because my ex-husband was in desert storm at one point in time, we were getting all these letters from the VA veterans, you know, administration, and they wanted both of us to be tested and and studied about the Gulf War, you know, the disease and the, the Gulf War pill and all this stuff. So we were going to the VA hospital in um, Brockton, Massachusetts, and it was like the P Persian Gulf War something study because they were saying that a lot of these um, military guys were coming back, having kids, and their kids would be deformed and, you know, missing arms and, you know, things like that. And they thought it was from the Gulf War pill. But my ex-husband didn't take the Gulf War pill. He refused. He he pretended to take it. Well, that's what he said. And then when he was overseas, he told me that he got um, exposed to mustard gas and all kinds of all kinds of crap. And so um, when I met him, he was in the Marines uh, stationed in Camp Lejeune from night. Well, he started in 1987, got out in 1991. So he went from Camp Lejeune, North Carolina to Bridgeport, California for mountain climbing training. Then he went to Okinawa. Then he went to, I believe, South Korea, the Philippines. And then he was guarding nuclear power plants. He was Camp actually Lejeune uh, guarding... was just recently in the news. There's uh, three men Lawsuits. who served there. Well, no, they're, oh, no. They're, 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 they just, they were parked at a gas station. They're just found in their vehicle dead. And it was on the news recently. And there's like no suspected foul play. And I literally laughed. I was really? like, come on. Yeah, it was, Camp, it was Camp Lejeune. It happened literally like yesterday or the day before or something like that. Oh, wow. I, yeah, not, because um, they are getting sued because of the water issue. I guess that there's something wrong with the water at Camp Lejeune. And all these people are getting cancer. Yeah, And so they were like, if you were there between like 1986 or 87 to like now, you know, you can sue the <laughs> U.S. Marine Corps. And uh, when I met my ex-husband, he, you know, he was showing me all his military stuff and it's a lot of propaganda, you know, from Kuwait. And, and he was stationed, he was in the desert in Kuwait, like for nine months, he was a mortarman. So he was not a very high ranking Marine. And he never advanced in the Marines. Like he just got out and he was just like a corporal or something. Um, but in one of these, the albums he was showing me, like, oh, these are my pictures of me in the Marines. There was something very disturbing in there. And it was a flyer from the Marine Corps and it said, rape, kill, pillage, and burn on it. And I said, what is this? And he's like, that's the motto for the U.S. Marine Corps. And I said, that's, that's weird i mean that's crazy and so i looked it up years later and i guess there was a um someone at camp lejeune like some kind of you know drill sergeant or something and he came up with that slogan and i guess this uh this 18 year old kid's mom found out that this that he said that this is the slogan for the marine corps rape kill pillage and burn i mean it sounds like something from like vietnam you know what i mean where a lot of our servicemen went overseas and a lot of people ended up you know, having kids and, and, you know, I don't know if they were from rapes or if they were prostitutes or whatever, but, you know, it, it's, um, they ended up getting rid of that motto in 1980 something, like right around the time, right around the time he joined, which is weird. But, um, yeah, I mean, 
he, the reason why he got the job with the NSA was because he was going to be fired from his other job and they wanted to get rid of him. So they gave him raving recommendations and they were going to fire him, but they decided not to because he said he was leaving. So they were like, good, we don't want to deal with you. Like, you know, and, uh, he had to go through an extensive background check. So I don't know how they didn't find that he had a juvie record, um, I guess because it was sealed, but you'd think NSA, they could find out anything, right? Um, there's a lot of things that they just overlooked, like the fact he had two or two restraining orders previously for domestic violence. If they want somebody to work for them that's going to, that, you know, do bad things, there yeah. need to be a bad person. And that's the kind of person they're looking for sociopaths. They're not looking for Mr. Rogers. They're looking for terrible no. people. Right. And he ended up um, getting his master's degree. He went to Westfield uh, State College in Western Massachusetts, got his degree in um, bachelor's degree in criminal justice. Then he went to Western New England College, got his master's degree in criminal justice administration because in Massachusetts, they have what they call the Quinn bill. So if you're a police officer, you, if the, the higher the education you have, the more pay you get. So if back in the early 2000s, if you had a master's degree, you get paid 40% more than a cop with a high school diploma. So in Massachusetts, everybody was getting their, their degrees to get that pay increase. Because most of the cops working there back in the early 2000s were making like fifty, sixty thousand $60,000, which was a lot of money at that time. Um, you know, and I'm just, I just was like, I couldn't believe the corruption that was going on. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about murders. I'm talking about cover-ups. I'm talking about all kinds of crazy shit that, sorry, <laughs> that I'm okay. saying, the police department was involved in. Yeah, and well, unfortunately, time, it, it when power attracts the wrong people, then that's just the way it is. And unfortunately, it, it's not it's not uncommon for there to be this type of corruption. It's not, it's, it's obviously yeah. not an isolated incident. No. And, and it's scary that we have a guy like this working for the NSA, but the good thing is he's not an SPO special police officer anymore because of me, because of the information that I gave them, they were going to go through what they call an adjudication hearing and a court martial. And I remember one time he slept overslept for work and the NSA was calling and they were like, we're sending the MPs to your house. And I'm like, we live in Pennsylvania. I'm like, what do you mean? He's not, he's a civilian employee of the NSA. I mean, he's not military. He was military, but he's not military anymore. And they're like, yeah, but it doesn't matter. He's employed by the NSA. And, you know, we, we're going to send MPs out if he doesn't come to work within like a certain time frame. And I'm like, this is weird. And at one, another time, they um, let him live on the base at 7223 Hall Street Unit E as an echo. Um, and when my kids went there, my daughter ended up, um, I'm not sure what happened because one of my sons is Asperger's and I have mild Asperger's. So, you know, I never relied on my son taking care of his little sister because even though he's three years older, he's just never had that, you know. He, he just, I didn't trust him. Not that he would do anything to his sister. He's just, he just, you know, was in his own little world. And so um, my ex-husband let my kids go to this playground on the NSA base, on the army base, and let them go by themselves. And my daughter was six years old and my son was nine at the time. And so um, I always told my son, you know, it's just keep an eye on your sister. Like, you know, don't let anybody take her away from the playground, you know, but I never, I never let my kids alone anywhere, but now my daughter's being targeted. Um, she came home with a broken arm. I asked my uh, son what happened. I asked her what happened. I got several different stories. Um, oh, uh, I fell off the monkey bars. Somebody pushed me off the monkey bars. Um, and then my son said that he saw his sister being led away from the playground by a man that he didn't know. So he followed them. And then he's, you know, he got nervous. So he's like, that's my sister. And then the guy let go of her hand and, and walked somewhere else. But why my ex-husband wouldn't tell me this is beyond me. And then the other thing too was uh, when my daughter was 16 years old, 
um she looked a lot younger than she you know she is she looked like she was like 13 14 and because my ex-husband lives on a cul-de-sac the bus can't go down that road they can't turn around so she has to have a bus stop a mile away from the house so she got dropped off in front of an elementary school and she was walking past the elementary school so it looked like or it might have been a middle school but she, so she looked like she'd gotten out of that school and so someone started following her home and my daughter um, had cut across a parking lot in Mar this is in Maryland because my ex-husband kidnapped my kids in 2014. I had custody of my kids and um, my son disappeared from school, never came home. And then my daughter came home by herself and I said, where's your brother? You're supposed to pick you up and bring you home. Like, the, like my driveway was really long and he would wait there for his sister to get off the bus. He didn't show up. So she came home by herself. And then uh, this was after my first grandchild was born. So this is 2000, June 2014. Turns out my ex-husband intercepted him between like leaving school and getting on the school bus because I called the school bus company. He was not there. He was not on the bus, but he was at school that day. My son was 14 at the time. My daughter was 12. Several days later, the sheriff's office, the York County Sheriff's Office, Justin Kohler and another sheriff came to my house banging on the door saying that they had a federal restraining order from the NSA in hand and that they were there to take my daughter away from me. And I was like, federal restraint? There's no such thing as a federal restraining order. I mean, even I know that. There's no such thing. And so I let them in and I was like, what's going on here? And they're like, oh, your ex-husband's in the driveway. I look out the window, see his car there. It was a Mercedes with blacked out windows with Maryland plates. And I'm sitting here like, this is like a nightmare coming true. I mean, he's, they're taking my kids away from me again. And so um, my daughter said she didn't want to go. She was literally clinging to me, screaming, crying, mommy, I don't want to go to dad's. I don't want to go to dad's. Don't make me go live there, please. And she used to come home with drawings on NSA papers that she saw on her dad's desk she would literally take papers that said like nsa on it and draw on them and she'd draw pictures of herself crying saying help me mommy on it God. and this is what i had to deal with and she came home with a black eye she came home with a broken arm she came home without her jacket like three times in the winter time i mean my kids would say that their dad didn't feed them and so you know i'm sitting here like who's who's the real abuser I mean, he used to abuse all our pets. I mean, you know that somebody that abuses pets and children is a psychopath or a sociopath. And even his own family said he was a psychopath. That he, when he came back um, from Desert Storm, he brought back pictures of dead people and children and, and, and passing it around the dinner table with his family. And they were like, what is what? Like, really? Like, he's, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder, but... He wasn't right before he even went into the Marines. He, he was severely, severely abused as a child, like like just as bad as me. And so uh, he and he never dealt with it. When my parents got a divorce, they forced me and my sister into therapy. And I remained in therapy from 1984 until about four years ago. So I've had, I think, about a total of 36 years of continuous therapy all through college, all through my marriage, all through everything that I've been going through. And um, even my therapist knew I was targeted. So one day, um, my Massachusetts therapist that I had for eight years, she called me crying. My therapist called me crying. And I was like, what is going on? And she goes, um, Child Protective Services came and took away my daughter and said I was sexually abusing my daughter. And now I've lost custody of her permanently. And she was 10 years old. She's still not seen her to this day. Her daughter's going to be 22. Her daughter's birthday was literally like five or six days before my daughter's birthday. The same month, the same year, everything. And she's not the only one. A lot of my friends, they lost their jobs, gotten fired, lost their custody of their kids, all because they want they try to help me against my ex-husband. And so now nobody wants to help me. So I've got no family no kids. No, nobody talks to me and my family. Um, I don't have a relationship with my kids. My oldest son, you know, not talking to me right now, but my other son, he just graduated college. I wasn't invited to his graduation. When my daughter graduated high school, I wasn't invited to her graduation. I missed years and years of their lives. And I'm they sorry. were brainwashed against me to, to, to think that I'm crazy 
and they and when I try to talk to them about being a targeted individual, they're like, "Mom, you're crazy. There's something wrong with you." And I'm like trying to explain like I I just got hacked um and when I got hacked in June, June 9th, everybody like all my closest friends all got hacked and then they were getting weird messages, emails, you know, asking all kinds of personal questions about me or saying that they are me and, and you know and my son's like it's a nigerian scammer mom it's not you're crazy stop saying this stuff you need to stop and then my other son said the same thing mom you you've got to stop talking about the nsa why oh because i'm telling the truth because they don't want people to know what they've been doing to me and i i was suffering for the last 20 years from this bizarre medical condition that nobody could figure out what it was. And I had to figure it out myself where I felt like I was being cooked alive and feeling like my skin is so hot. I have, I mean, anyone that knows me will tell you, I sleep with like three ice packs on my body every single night. I can't sleep because I figured out it was energy weapons. And I, you know, I mean, it sounds crazy, but it's not, it's, it's not, it's I mean, all I literally proven. feel it's like I'm there. being cooked alive. It's all, it's and all there. The, the technology exists. The patents exist. Security apparatus, the military apparatus exists. Um, the things that they can do with 5G technology and Wi Fi and everything like that uh, mm -hmm. can't be understated. It can't be overstated. Um, it can only be understated because, uh, and, and, and for me, what, what I think we, what we have here is why, why this affects the viewers uh it doesn't just affect targeted individuals is in my opinion it seems to me that they're building they're building a dystopian control system mm. where they'll be, and they're and so right now all they're doing is just testing it really is what it seems like to me and choosing individuals that for whatever reason and um just that th they can do this to anyone they they, they can mm -hmm. Mess and the up thing, anyone's life. And the thing too is that I have psychic abilities. And I remember asking my father about that. And I said to him, I was probably 12 years old. So I used to have a photographic memory until I got stabbed in the face um, and left for dead. And um, after I got out of the hospital, I was originally in shock trauma. Um, it happened in broad daylight. I was approached by two men and they demanded that I give them my phone. Why they specifically said my phone and not my wallet or anything else. It had all the information about the NSA on there. Luckily, I had given out that information to multiple people because once they stole my phone, I still had all the information because it was on Facebook Messenger that I'd sent to multiple people, plus emails that I've sent, you know, documents I've sent to other people just in case something happens to me because I feel like they're going to, they're trying to kill me. You know, I've had mysterious accidents. Um, October 24th, 2008 in Limeboro, Maryland. I was driving, all, you know, on my way to work. Somebody spilled diesel fuel all over the back road. I literally did a 360 spun. My car hit the uh, tree head on and I had a um, head injury, a concussion. I had post-traumatic amnesia. I couldn't remember anything for the longest time. And my kids were worried about me. I mean, I was like literally like renting stuff at Redbox, And then like the next day I'd rent the same movie and they'd be like, mom, we already rented this. I'm like, no, we didn't. I have no, I had no memory of it. And I would like lose, you know, lapses of time. Um, I couldn't function. Um, and then, you know, when, when you're targeted, it's like, I tried to, I try my best to, you know, like videotape people or, you know, take pictures, you know, to prove this stuff, but it's, they make it like, so unbelievable that people just don't believe you. They look like normal people. They seem like right. normal people. Right. They hire people from all ethnic backgrounds, all ages, all, and it's not just guys in blacked out military SUVs with tactical gear on, or right? Wearing or men in black wearing suits. It's, it's there's a lot of people in on it, and it's it's uh. What we have with the military right now is we have a, a whole entire other society 
that exists within our own society within plain sight. And mm -hmm. these people that are part of this national security administration and part of these gang stalking groups, what have you, they believe that they've reached this higher echelon of society and that they're protected and that when the great fall happens or the great reset happens or whatever, they'll be mm -hmm. taken care of while the rest of us will be left in the dust. Right. Um, so that's the reason why it's so motivating for them to stay. And also not the, also the fact that if they were to retaliate, they were to do something about it once they get deep enough where they realize what's actually happened, which of course they warm you up to it. You don't just step into it right away. Once you mm -hmm. get to the point where you realize what you're a part of and how evil it is, they can very easily turn that evil against you, your family, the people you care about, and make you a gang stalked individual. So it's very hard to, uh, for people to come forward and talk about it that are on the other side of it, that have done the gang stalking or have worked for the NSA and know the nefarious things they're doing. Not that there aren't whistleblowers and they aren't out there, but they really mm -hmm. they risk everything uh, to talk. Yeah. And, and not enough people are listening either. It, mm -mm. Cause there's a, well, there's a NSA whistleblower by the name of Karen Melton Stewart. And then there was also another whistleblower, um, William something. Um, I can't remember his last name right this minute. It, it was, it was from a, a while, a while back. And, um, he was talking, I saw a YouTube video one time where he was talking about if you are employed by the NSA and you're going through a divorce, the NSA will help you against your ex. And I, I've actually seen this in another um, family that was an NSA family. They did the same thing. Cut the mother out, the father got custody of the kids, and then they brainwashed all the kids. And at one point in time, I, my son said, Mom, um, I want to go intern at the NSA. And I said, absolutely not. He goes, well, I need your permission. I said, well, I'm not going to give you permission. And he's like, well, then I can't do it. I said, okay, then you can't do it. They wanted a copy of my birth certificate. Why? The NSA Sketchy. want a copy of my version of it? For what? Yeah, and the unfortunate thing about this is, like, you know, a, a lot of the stuff, just your story, because I've done a little research on the subject, and I'm also – so I guess to, to, to just kind of add why I, I had you on the show and why I take the subject seriously is um, my father was a targeted individual. Um He's also a secret space program survivor. I mean, all this stuff is generational, right? Um, mm -hmm. And um, he kind of started waking up and realizing what was going on. And he was telling people about it. Even my aunt, my aunt told me that he sounded really like, he, at first he was like really sane. And she's like, wow, he like figured out some crazy stuff like with the aliens and the UFOs and all that. She said he made sense. But then he started to sound crazy. He, he started thinking God was talking to him and stuff. And that's a common voice to skull technology thing where they use this voice to skull, um, which you may have never ha experienced that, but that's common, especially with, okay, like homeless people and then them using the V2K on them. And then I've said it multiple times where the people that are, I call them assets, the people are being used in these programs. They have clones out there that they're using and making them do stuff like that, stuff like that. A lot of their, uh, source codes a lot of the people that like the original or whatever that they're taking the dna and the, the consciousness from and using over and over again unstable mm -hmm. people that are living in the streets and stuff like that it's not yeah um it's not strong buffed out guys that are going to the gym every day and they they they're in the army and stuff like that it's 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 there's a lot of broken people because of these programs and what they're doing to people like mm -hmm. there's a lot of broken people and and um you know, my dad almost died because of the voice to skull. They they said that he if he didn't kill himself, they'd they'd kill his whole family and stuff like this. And he thought it was demons talking to him. But uh, you um, know, yeah, yeah. that makes that makes sense because now you reminded me of um, I don't know if you ever saw that movie Beautiful Mind with Russell mm -hmm. Crowe, where they were saying that he was you know schizophrenic. Several years ago, him and his wife were killed in this tragic accident in i think new york city both of them in, in a cab or something and he was the one that was like saying there was an implant in his arm and he was literally like taking a knife and trying to dig this out and they were just saying he was schizophrenic he was hearing voices and he even went out and said he was schizophrenic but i you know looking back and watching that movie you know i'm sitting here like he seemed like he was a targeted individual 
to me. I mean, the guy yeah, was brilliant. Yeah, you see more and more of this, like, with Sunit O'Connor especially. She just passed away. I um, can't believe. I am so upset. I can't yeah, believe she died. It was, She's it was been through so much. So much and yeah, pain. She, she stood up for... She stood up for me and all the other people who have been abused by the Catholic Church. And yeah. those are, they are some evil, evil, evil motherfuckers that are at the core of that church. Um, yeah. And it's, yeah, she was targeted. You can tell, obviously, just in sometimes it's not like, it doesn't always have to be, it's kind of like the beginning of your story. It's very, it's very grounded in reality. You don't sound crazy at all to me. Like it, and, mm. and and the same thing with with Sonid. Her hers is very grounded in reality. They just messed up her career. She her career was ruined instantly because she just said something that was too true. And um, oh yeah, and Saturday Night Live when she ripped up the picture of the Pope. I yeah. I remember that. I I I I believe I, I even watched it live. I mean I I remember that. You know, and then they went out and uh, took all her CDs and 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 you know destroyed them all in the streets of New York. And Frank, you know, said, was, Frank Sinatra said he was gonna he wanted to punch her in the face. Fuck yeah, I mean it was it, it it caused a lot of, but but it was like even when she said that when I was seventeen years old, I asked my father. I said, why are there so many Catholic priests that are pedophiles? And he's like, well, that's like saying all the men in the Navy are gay. I go, and, and I don't even know how I knew. I was 17 years old. This was like 1987. Now, 1987, I had told my therapist uh, that I had been being sexually abused, but I didn't tell him the full story. I told him like only one of my family members did it. I didn't tell him that they all were doing it. And so um, he's like, well, how would you like to get away from your family? And he made it sound like it was like a summer camp. You know, I was 17. I've been running away from home. I joined a gang. I was, you know, on my way to like doing bad things. And even though, you know, I was like, I want to finish school. I, I mean, I had all these dreams, but my family, you know, they, they had me involved in just all kinds of crazy stuff. I mean, they were swingers. Um, they had a lot of people coming over the house. Um, and, and, and I was talking about this. I was telling people about this and they shut me up by having me locked up in a psych ward. So in 1987, I spent the entire summer at Charles River Hospital, which is an adolescent psychiatric uh, hospital in Wellesley, Massachusetts. Now, Wellesley is where my dad was from, but he was from Wellesley Hills, which is the, you know, the, the, the real affluent suburb of Boston, where one time one of the Celtics, uh, D. Brown, who was black, lived in Wellesley Hills and he got pulled over by the police department for being black for racial profile. And they're like, what are you doing in this area? Uh, I live here. <laughs> like... You know what I mean? And so they they were upset that, you know, someone like D. Brown would be living in their neighborhood because it's an elitist neighborhood for all the wasps, you know. And, and now I can't even say that term on Facebook without going to Facebook jail. But that was a term that my dad used freely all, you know, like I'm a wasp, like I'm a second part. I mean, I, I, I heard all these phrases like my dad was, I would call him sort of like the king of cliches i mean my i was told children should be seen and not heard that was drilled in my head uh, all through childhood that i wasn't allowed to talk i wasn't allowed to have an opinion if i played the radio if i sang a song my dad would be like freaking slap me across the face you know i i i played the violin because my mom was one of those like japanese stage moms so i took skating lessons ballet lessons sailing lessons tennis lessons violin lessons summer camps like you know i had the best of everything financially but i just didn't have parents that were there for me my mom was always suicidal my mom suffered from mental illness um never diagnosed with anything um she used to lock me and my sister in the basement not feed us you know she was yes. having sex with multiple men in front of us you know exposing us to all this stuff and now i have a witness i have a witness and i went down to the police department a couple of months ago to report that uh, my mom had uh this police officer that used to rent a room in our house in the summertime after she got a divorce because my mom won everything in the divorce she cleaned my dad out like everything he left with like the clothes on his back he had no money nothing she got it all and so um my uh, uh this this man was running a room in my mom's house in the summer of about 1985 so i was about 15 and uh he 
my mom sold me to him. And uh, I reported to the police two months ago, and they were doing an investigation. They said they were going to help me. They said, you know, we believe you, and the laws have changed. Now it's like 34 years from the time, you know, that it happened that you can report this. Before, it used to be three years. I sued my family in 1992 to 93 for sexually abusing me and forcing me into child porn, which is which is sex trafficking. That's what the Human Sex Trafficking Hotline and places like Operation Underground Railroad, they which I have a certification for signs of trafficking through there. Now, you know, with that sound of freedom thing, there's a lot of controversy going on. I don't know what to think. I don't even want to get into it. But, um, you know, it, I, I sued my family and all of a sudden my lawyer started, you know, being indifferent towards me and saying, well, you know, I had a conversation with your mom and she's really concerned about your welfare and, you know, she's offering this settlement. And I said, what, 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 what do you mean? Well, she'll leave you something in her will. <laughs> like, no, I said, it's not even about the money. I don't care about the money. I was suing them for a million dollars. They were going to go after the homeowner's insurance of the house where the abuse happened, but it happened in multiple houses. It happened in three different houses. And one of them, we didn't even own the house. So, um, when we first moved to Truro, we were living in this cottage next to the Sacred Heart Cemetery where a lot of weird activities occurred, you know, like just really weird stuff. Um, and there's a lot of UFO activity there too. We were renting a house, a little a cottage rather, um, from a famous author who actually uh, was an ex-army captain, and he was born in the early in the early 1920s. So I believe he might have been Korean War era, but he was friends with my dad. I don't really want to say his name right this minute, but I firmly believe he was CIA. When we went to this house in Truro, um, it was filled with illegal pornography, like everywhere. I mean, like stacks and stacks of illegal pornography, including child pornography, uh, like like illegal pornography from like Germany and other countries where the women's like eyes would be blacked out and stuff. And um, I was exposed to this because my father uh, had been married multiple times. My mom was actually his third wife. So when my mom married him, she was already pregnant with me and she was 25. My dad was 38. That she was his third wife and he's 38. So his second wife was Japanese. He had two kids with her and uh, my sister, Barbara Ann and my brother, Daniel Allen Dunham. Well, I learned, you know, moving to, to America, it was, it was like a shell shock going from Tokyo. And I went from Tokyo to Anaheim, California. And this is all in like less than a year's period. Um, we were staying with another CIA family that they all came back to the well, United Disney, States at Disneyland the same time. Is. Yes, and they took me to Disneyland. And I remember going there, and I don't remember p other people being there. I remember it was almost like a private tour of me and this other family. And I, I just remember the girl's name was Caroline. They lived in Anaheim. Her parents were American, and we knew them from Japan. And there was another family in Texas. Uh, their last name was Cheney. Like Dick Cheney, their last name was Cheney. Um, I don't, I, I, I don't remember like all their names. Um, and then there was all other families. There was, a, there was another guy I found on the internet um, that had I knew in Japan as a child because we were friends as children. And when I started talking about, you know, why did your family come back to America at the same time? You know, but I, I was actually Japanese, you know, born in Japan, but I was born a U.S. citizen overseas because my dad was military. But when he died and I got his DD-214 to bury him for free at the National Cemetery in Bourne, which is on Cape Cod, and my sister took half the other ashes and brought, took them to Japan, um, it said he was only in the Marines for two years. And that he was honor he was honorably discharged after two years of service. That doesn't make sense. Even my ex husband said it didn't make sense. And the DD two fourteen, uh, if I remember correctly, my ex husband said that it looked like he joined the Marines ten days before the Korean War era, uh, the Korean War uh, ended. But then when I was looking up stuff on Ancestry dot com. I mean, it might make be a mistake, but they said he joined the Marines in December twelfth of nineteen fifty three. 
So there's a lot of weird, you know, misinformation. And, and um, they said that the, the middle military, the DD-214 record, they had to get off microfilm. So it was like really like you can really see a lot of it. But specifically, it said he was only there for two years. But my dad had these unusual tattoos. Excuse me. He had um, a Black Panther on his, I think it was his left arm, a leaping Black Panther that he got in Hawaii while he was on leave. And then he had another tattoo, which was a skull with a sword through it with a snake coming out of his eye. Now, never really thought about that tattoo until I started looking into, you know, all the stuff about my dad after he died. And when my dad died, he was found dead after a week and someone shut off his air conditioning. So he died, you know, he died and then like, you know, decomposed because he was in Sarasota, Florida in the summertime. Somebody ransacked his house. The detective that I spoke to that did the investigation on his death was named Detective Leg L-E-G-G -G, from the Sarasota Police Department. And when I read the police report, it was, it was very weird. Um, my father had been found in the bathroom dead after a week working at Wacken Hut Security. And the person that found him was from Wacken Hut Security. They noticed that he didn't come to work for a week. And then they're like, finally decided to go to his house. And they noticed that the garage door was open. His car was in the garage. The newspapers were piled up, you know, on the porch or whatever, or in front of the house. And he lived at, I think, 2928, 2928 Captiva Way in Sarasota, Florida, which was a gated community. I've never been there. And they said his house was ransacked and that he died while he was going to the bathroom. And I was found dead. Like, you know, he wasn't wearing a shirt. He was wearing like jean shorts and boxer shorts. And there was like, you know, down to his knees. And he, it was in a humiliating manner. But then they said that there was human feces all over his bedroom, the laundry room, like, like a trail of it, like going to the bathroom or something. And I'm like, that doesn't, does, I don't know, like something doesn't make sense. And then they said that they, it looked like there was a, a lunch that was already set up on the, on the in the kitchen. Like it almost looked like it was placed there. It was like a cup of tomato soup and a, bod, a, a bottle of vodka and like a glass that was going to be for the vodka, I guess. And they said that my dad was dirt poor. He had no money. Um, he was like literally on food stamps and I, I was just like, I had not seen my dad since I was 17 years old. He communicated with me, but I, didn't, I refused to see him. And so um, when I was 24 years old and I was a college student, my dad was very sick, very sick person. And he wrote me a letter when I was in college at Suffolk University in Boston. I was living with my sister and she was helping me raise my kids because I had two kids while I was in college. It took me 10 years to get my bachelor's degree. So in the midst of my lawsuit with my parents... Um, I was in college at Goddard College in Vermont. I had graduated from Cape Cod Community College with my associate's degree. I applied to Goddard College as, at the request of my therapist because she had gone to Goddard and she said they had a single parent program. I could bring my son there. He was two. So I was like, all right, I'm going to apply. I got like this huge scholarship, like 20 something thousand dollars worth of scholarships. I had to only take out a loan for like $4,000 to go there. And so I moved there. And then um, shortly thereafter, there, I noticed like the college was very weird and it was an alternative college. You grade yourself. Um, I, I wanted to be a teacher at that time. I was studying education and I was going to write a thesis based on this Pearl Jam video of Jeremy. Um, and, and, and I was going to use that as part of my thesis, you know, about, you know, of child abuse and, and, and I wanted to work with kids that were abused. I wanted to work like in a reform school or maybe like a juvenile home or something or, or kids in foster care. Like I wanted to help those kind of kids cause I'd been through a lot of stuff in my own life. And so, um, I noticed there was a guy picketing outside the co college and he had signs that said the CIA runs this college. And I was told by the college, don't talk to the guy. He's crazy, you know. And so what do I do? I go talk to the guy. And I said, what are you talking about? What do you mean the CIA runs this college? So he uh, said that he had been a student there. And um, he uncovered something. And he had a girlfriend that was there as well. But the girlfriend ended up staying at the college. And they kicked him out. They ended up kicking me out too. 
because um, I started finding out stuff too. And then uh, one of the teachers that I had uh, failed me for one of my classes because he was acting inappropriately with me in a sexual manner. And I reported him to the uh, president, Jackson Keitel, at the time. And uh, I had been talking to my friend Vicky in the mailroom and I was leaning over talking to her and the teacher came up behind me and grabbed me, you know, in a sexual manner. And I turned around and saw who it was. And then he started writing me love letters, just weird stuff about why don't you wear this to class and just putting it in my mailbox at, at school. And so I showed it to the president and he's like, well, you know what, um, white men, white men, you know how, you know how they are with Asian women. I said, so it makes it right. And this is 1992, 93, it, during the midst of my lawsuit. So um, during that time, you know, I'm trying to be a college student, but I'm trying to be a mom. And I got invited to go out to a party and I really didn't want to go. I wasn't really like a party person. I wasn't into drinking. I was never really into drugs. Like I might've smoked marijuana, but that was about it. I was always like, not, I didn't never want to drink alcohol because of my parents. So um, I took the, I took a couple of kids that, you know, went to the college with me up to Burlington, Vermont for a rave. And I don't know nothing about raves. Like I was like, they knew about it. like, oh, we got to go on this like scavenger hunt and find this place. And while I was there, there was a guy standing behind me in line. And uh, he started talking to me and my friends. And he said he was a foreign exchange student. Well, come make a long story short. This guy drugged me, kidnapped me, held me hostage for approximately a day or day and a half to two days. And I don't remember how I got away from him. But um, it turned out he was not a foreign exchange student. He lied. And he looked a lot like my father. But then again, he looked a lot like the guy I was dating at the time. He was six foot five, Caucasian, blue eyed, white blonde hair, like looked very Aryan. And he told me half the truth that he was from, his mom's from Amsterdam, but his father was a major in the Air Force. So you got that military connection, the overseas connection. And I even said to him, if you're from Amsterdam, why don't you have an accent? And he said, well, because I went to an American school. Oh, okay. Well, my sister went to an American school in Japan. So that made sense to me, like military, you know, kids, military brats. And um, so he probably said that he was, a, he was a foreign exchange student, so I wouldn't look for him. But I wasn't stupid. I mean, I literally went on my own investigation to find who he was after it happened. Because I didn't know his name. I didn't know anything about him. And uh, I used to hang out on Church Street in Burlington, Vermont with my friends. And I ran into a guy working at a sunglass hut on Church Street. And he happened to be at the rave. And he knew this guy because I saw them hanging out together. And I said, oh, like, I, I just pretended like, oh, hey, remember that cute guy at the party? What was his name? Where's he from? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's so-and-so. So I turned him into the police they interviewed him. They said, he said it was consensual that he didn't even know who I was. I'm like, okay, you don't know who I am, but it was consensual. Like what? And a month later I found out I was pregnant mm -hmm. and, uh, the police said they didn't believe me. They said that, you know, that I'm a liar. And then when I told them I was pregnant because they made me call the campus police cause I thought it happened on the campus of UVM and cause from my memory. And it happened on April 3rd, 1993. The reason why I remember that date is because it's my son's aunt's birthday and two of his cousin's birthdays all on April 3rd. So I remembered it was April 3rd. And, um, but when, when I remember bits and pieces of, of what happened and he drugged me probably with GHB or whatever it's called, I couldn't move. I couldn't scream. I couldn't do anything. Um, and I felt like somebody put like Vaseline on my eyes or something. I couldn't see, I couldn't open my eyes. And when I tried to open my eyes, it was like all goopy. And then, um, later he carried me across the hall and bathed me because, you know, like it seemed like he had done it before. And um, this is actually how I met my ex-husband. Whoop. Oh, okay. I, it, you cut out for a minute. Um, when I met my ex-husband, I was dating him for a very short time, like a week. And um, I noticed a lot of red flags. And I had just gotten out of a domestic violence relationship. And uh, it was the first one I was ever in. 
years later, the guy got hit by a FedEx truck and died instantly. Um, but that guy abused me and, and one of my kids real bad. And I had to leave Atlanta, Georgia to escape from him. But I knew him from, from since elementary school. We went to church together. We went to church together. We were acolytes together in the church at Wellfleet Congregational Church. Um, we went to Sunday school together. We went to birthday parties, like back and forth. His parents were friends with my parents. His mom was my Sunday school teacher. Um, and he, this guy was also military, Air Force. He was dishonorably discharged. Um, sometime in the early 90s um, for dealing drugs over the Canadian border because he was stationed in Maine in the Air Force. Um, so pretty much everyone that's abused me has some kind of military connection. Oh, Air you know. Force, guys. Yeah, I, and Marine. And that's um, a yeah and they, you know the D, the DOD Department of Defense is the NSA I mean that's in and, and, and recently you know I don't mind messing with the NSA people say well you know you shouldn't be doing this stuff but when I called there and they gave me the runaround and they were like well you know um you, why don't you call the NSA agents and I called them and they're like well you know uh why don't you call this this person at the NSA police department? So I call the NSA police, and then like, no, 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 we, you know, you should be talking to MPI, Military Police Investigations Chief Russell Wilson, at the uh, Army base. Why about my ex-husband? I said, what happened to the investigation that he was under? Well, you'll have to talk to MPI about that now. So I call Chief Russell Wilson at MPI, and uh, he tells me to call my local senator to complain about my ex-husband. I was like, okay, been there, done that. I've called like every federal agency, every kind of person I could think of that could help me. Not one person would return my phone calls. I've called every major, you know, newspaper, um, Dateline, 2020, Nancy Grace, Tucker Carlson. I mean, you name it, I called them. See, even CNN. I mean, everybody. Not one person would talk to me. They said, yeah, you sound crazy. Click. They I'm don't sorry want to hear that about it. Yeah, well, and they probably get paid to not say shit. You know, say anything. Sorry. That's fine. I swear all the time on the show. It's 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 such a <laughs> dark subject matter that I feel like we don't have to act like kids are going to be watching this, right? You know, we can, right. we can speak like adults. But the um, other the, the other one thing that I wanted to say that I totally forgot was when my mom had that secret phone line. One day it started ringing, but it was like two years after my parents' divorce. So I came home from school and I was like, what's that noise? And there was, the phone was ringing in the other room, but normally that phone wasn't plugged in. So since my father was no longer in the home, my mom had this extra phone line. And so it started ringing and I picked it up and uh, I was like, hello. There was a man's voice on the other end. It said, um, Hi, can I speak to Robert Dunham or Bob Dunham? I'm calling from California. And the voice sounded really familiar. And I was like, um, my dad doesn't live here anymore. I was like 15 years old at the time. I said, my dad, my parents got divorced. My dad doesn't live here anymore. And he's like, oh, do you know how to get a hold of him? I said, who is this? Because I was always taught to like answer the phone, you know, properly and, you know, take message or whatever. So I said, who is calling, please? And the guy said, Carl Sagan. Yeah, that's pretty surprising. Also, not but... yes. I mean, this was nineteen eight, like nineteen eighty six. So I said, um, "Well, my dad doesn't live here anymore, so um, I can give him a message." I don't remember. I don't think I ever gave him the message. So I looked up what happened with Carl Sagan in nineteen eighty six, like years later, and he was involved in uh, protesting a nuclear power plant in California, and he was arrested at that time. But why was he calling my dad? And help. yeah, exactly. Because when my dad was in that newspaper article about the Japanese mob attacking him at the parliament in Fukuoka was because Nobushiki Kishi, who is the prime minister of Japan, um, who was Shinzo Abe's grandfather, the, the former prime minister that was murdered, like what was it last summer or whatever, the, you know, was shot with that by that crazy military guy or whatever. Um, his, his grandfather um, 
was going to sign the Security Pact Treaty, and President Eisenhower was supposed to come to Japan at that time, but there was all this protests with these Japanese students. Now, when they when they reported it in, in Boston and my dad had all those like, newspaper articles, it made it look like Japanese mob attacks American businessman. But my dad was making movies. This was April of 1960. So the, the Japanese students were protesting that they didn't want President Eisenhower to go to Japan. They didn't want Nobushi Kikishi to sign the Security Pact Treaty, but he did. And then after that, he was ousted from office. But my dad was there, like just happened to be walking down the street at where the parliament building is and then gets attacked by these Japanese students and they, you know, throw rocks at his car and say, Yankee, go home. And, you know, like they didn't like Americans being there at that time. And then my dad got a call from President Eisenhower thanking him, like, like thanking him for telling him not to go to Japan at that time. And that was all in the scrapbook that was stolen after I was stabbed in the face, got out of the hospital, my car was missing for a month, and I had all my stuff in there. I even had stuff from the NSA. Everything was gone. When I got my car back, it was there was nothing in it. So somebody took it, and I'm pretty sure I know who. I mean, I can't say who specifically. It's not going to be my ex-husband doing the dirty work. It's always somebody else. Because um, my birth certificate was in that car. And uh, it was my original birth certificate from Japan. And uh, last year, I found my birth certificate. It just appeared in amongst my belongings that I had taken out of my ex-boyfriend's shed. And I'm pretty sure he stole the car because he had my extra key. And, um, and then I started, like, un, you know unpacking boxes that I hadn't unpacked because I had no room at the time. And when I started unpacking boxes that he packed, he packed all my stuff up when I was, when he kicked me out and I was homeless and I got stabbed because the reason why he did this is because my ex-husband called the police on him and said that he molested my daughter. And then he said that it was me that called the police because that's what they can do. They can make your phone look like you did something that you didn't do. And so at the time I had a track phone. It was a burner cell that I got at like Walmart for 20 bucks. I had that same phone for 10 years and, and I never had a problem with my phone getting hacked or nothing, but it was one of those when you add the minutes and it's like one of those flip phones where you have to like, you know, dial or press a like three times to get to C or, you know what I mean? It was one of those old, old phones. I had one of those for 10 years and, um, as soon as I got a computer and a laptop and the whole nine yards again, then all the targeted start started again, like even worse than ever. Um, the Facebook I have now is like, I think my 10th Facebook. Um, at one point in time during the, my custody trial, um, he posted a picture of our son from a vacation from 2004. We went to Arizona and put rest in peace with my son's name on it on my Facebook page. So everyone thought that I put it there. And then he took a screenshot of it and brought it to our child custody trial in Pennsylvania and said, look what she did. She's, she's saying our son's dead. She's crazy. And I said, objection. Cause I was my own lawyer at the time. And I said, I never posted that. He hacked my Facebook. He put that there. And in addition, I was arrested in, um, it was like December or January, 2008. This was prior to me even divorcing him or leaving him or anything. He, he already knew I was leaving him. You know, because he monitored everything. Like that video camera thing, the picture I sent you. My son found that video camera in my bedroom on my armoire while we were getting a divorce. Now, whether or not it was a working camera or whatever, you know, he might have just put that there to scare me. But um, he called my boyfriend at the time. And my boyfriend's ex-father-in-law was secret space program and he was found dead after a week on my ex-boyfriend's birthday no less and guess who found his body my ex-boyfriend he's the one that was telling me about the secret space program and i'd never heard about any of this before and so when i spoke to penny la shepherd years ago she was like that guy's your handler and i didn't want to hear about it i was like you're what like I don't, what what are you talking about and then that's when they started talking about you know MK Ultra, Project Monarch, and all this other stuff. And then um, I actually found a manual 
in possession in my ex-boyfriend's possession of how to create an mk ultra uh, victim it had the whole like layout of what you're supposed to do you know fracturing personalities and all you know i was just like why do you even wh what is this why do you have this because if you when you were talking about your father did you ever watch um i'm trying to think of the, the, the fort dietrich the the thing about uh the, the, the guy that um the biologists that they were dosing with the LSD and then they were taking him to Deep Creek Lake and he jumped out of a building in New York City and he was a scientist and his uh, son sued the government and got $250,000 yeah. um, and uh, they were dosing him with LSD without his knowledge. And then they later confessed and said that they were doing it and that they basically killed him. You know, and, and um, it was like there was a Netflix documentary uh, with um, Peter Skarsgård, I think it was, um, where he played the scientist and it was called like, was it Wormwood or Wormwood or something like that. Um, but it was a very interesting documentary about what the government, you know, does because there's all these different projects. And it's like we've been talking about this for the last 10 years and people just still don't want to believe whether it's Operation Mockingbird or Paperclip or, you know, Project Blue Beam or any of that stuff. They just, they just don't the think evidence, it's a The evidence is all there, though, and, and we're getting there. Yeah. Right now, we just have to f f all find each other and get our testimony out there and um, mm -hmm. try to organize, but the rest will come. I mean, you see, like, the, you know, the government's talking about UAPs and uh, I'm pretty sure today they admitted aliens are real or something. I haven't actually watched the video, but there's some sort of testimony. But um, mm -hmm. there's a lot of crazy things happening right now that it's looking good for us. Um, fingers crossed. We'll mm -hmm. see what happens. Um, it's now, been did you did you watch that empowered individuals? Um, yes, I did. Yeah, my friend made that. And so I thought that was interesting too, because you know they're they're targeting specific types of people that have. Yeah, they, they messed up my they messed up my life that in that, that in that way where they made it so. Like I used to be a musician and I used to play shows and they sabotaged my music career, um, through. I don't know. I just can tell that it's manipulated. And also, I got this warning from one of my alters before, like them targeting me was going to ramp up and then sure enough it did like i was going mm -hmm. to shows and they're like tommy you're not welcome here and like you gotta leave and like um, oh yeah i've had i've had stuff like that too because i have alters as well and it's really really hard to talk about you know because i only recently started talking about it because when you tell people they're like what are you schizophrenic what are you like you know what's wrong with you and and i get blamed for things you know and, and it's like they just, people just don't understand what certain types of abuse does, you know, to your personality, especially when you're, the younger well, you are, you know, and it's all, the altars are, with the altars, it's all designed and it's, it's, it's a way to break people and create agents, create assets and um, slaves, sex slaves or slaves of other types for literal labor. And, um, it shouldn't be looked at as like some sort of mental illness. Like it is, you know, we are affected by it. It makes our mental health poor, but it was literally like clinically done to us, like methodically, scientifically done to us. We're broken. That's, right. Um, That's what I've been trying to tell people. And then, you know, because with things like post-traumatic stress disorder or complex trauma, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and many, many years ago, I was so sick and tired of people saying I was crazy. I said, I'm going to get a second opinion, a third opinion. You know, I want to, I, I want to be clear to this. Cause I don't be, I mean, who wants to be labeled is, is crazy. Well, they and want so to I label went, us as crazy because then people won't listen to us, you know? So, right. And so what I, what I did was I put myself in a hospital and I said, I want to go to this, the specific hospital that I know that I heard is, is a good hospital um, because I saw it on in a movie, <laughs> you know. And so uh, if you ever watch Girl Interrupted um, with Winona Ryder and Angelina Jolie about a girl with borderline personality disorder, 
Um, it was based on a true story. I actually read the book and watched the movie. And so the hospital that the girl went to is McLean Hospital in Belmont, Massachusetts. Now, um, they had some satellite uh, psychiatric hospitals. One was in South Plymouth, you know, by Plymouth, Massachusetts, where, you know, Plymouth Rock and the Mayflower. Um, and then they had one in Brockton, Massachusetts, right next to the VA hospital. And so I put myself in the South Plymouth um, psych hospital of McLean. And when I got there via ambulance from Morton Hospital in Taunton, um, I was, you know, very excited to, to talk to somebody, you know, because I was like, well, this hospital, I, I you know, I, I think that they're going to, you know, finally give me a, a correct diagnosis. And so I was talking to one of the intake people and they were like, you know, you seem kind of bipolar, but you, you don't have flight of ideas and you keep, tra you know, you're, you keep on track with everything you're saying. And so, um, I saw the psychiatrist the next day and his name was Dr. Jeffrey Ritiger. Now, Dr. Jeffrey Ritiger has been on Oprah, Dr. Oz, The View. He's written the books. He's a minister, a Christian minister, and he's also the head of the psychiatry at Belmont, um, the McLean Hospital, and he's the head of the psychiatry department at Harvard Medical School. So um, I had been trying to reach him because he came up with a new diagnosis that he was going to write about in the New England Journal of Medicine at that time when I was speaking to him. And he was like, you're very interesting. Like, your story is interesting. He goes, do you mind if I if you tell your story to some of the medical students that I'm working with? So he invited these medical students to come talk to me about everything that's, that I was talking about at that time. And... Um, he said that they were creating this new diagnosis for the dis, uh, for the Diagnostic Systems Manual, the DSM, um, and it was going to be called Post Traumatic Stress Disorder with Trauma Induced Symptoms of a Mood Disorder. And I'm like, okay, what does that mean? And what he said was, it's basically post traumatic stress disorder that if you are like triggered. Um, that you have symptoms of a mood disorder, but technically you don't have the mood disorder. It's just that certain people can trigger you into sort of like this trauma-induced state of, of you know, post-traumatic stress disorder because, you know, a lot of people don't understand, like, I mean, it's, it's easy for them to understand PTSD if it's, like, happened to a war veteran. They could, you know, I mean, you, they make movies about it all the time, but... You know, as far as like DID, because now MPD, multiple personality disorder, is now called dissociative identity disorder. And the, the most famous movie is Sally Field in Sybil from 1976. Um, but then, you know, people watch it and they're just, it's just a movie. You know, they don't think that this is real. And, um, or, you know, if you do tell somebody, they, they just, people just aren't understanding. So it's like people like me just don't even want to talk about it. You know, because they're like, wow, like, well, I appreciate you having the courage to step forward and talk about it anyway. There are people out there willing to listen. We're gathering a larger and larger audience of people who are on board with the truth and what's actually happening. Uh, we are the disclosure um, and it's, it's happening. Um, so there is some hope. And yeah, I just really I can't thank you enough for coming on the show. <laughs> Well, you're welcome. I mean, I, I know we covered a lot of different things. Um, and as I said, like a lot of times um, I've done like podcasts. This is the first video I've done. Um, but I've never, you know, like I never come up with any questions ahead of time or, I, you know, like I just sort of do everything freestyle, and, you know, just so people can see, you know, that I'm not just like making stuff up or thinking, you know, thinking things. It's just everything that I'm saying is just from memory and experience and everything. And I, I think that your story really, if you're, if anyone's willing to listen to you from the ground up, tell it like you don't sound crazy to me at all. Um, it's very obvious to anyone who's done a bit of research that people in the military community, uh, if they're high ranking enough, they'll get away with stuff. I mean, I, I, I talked to um, somebody a few interviews ago where they had like a great uncle where he would, he would expose himself to people who do all sorts of terrible things and the military would always just bail him out of it. So it's like mm -hmm. these intelligence agencies look after each other and, you know, uh, like with the Marines having like rape, pillage, kill, like these organizations aren't good. Like it, no. it's unfortunate, but it's, it's true. Um, and they've been infiltrated by Satanists. Like that's mm -hmm. they've been infiltrated Michael by Michael Aquino. 
yeah, Michael Aquino and mm -hmm. the like. He's he's just the one of the guys who was open about it. He didn't care. But the, it's 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 like it's all real and the only way to to get the cockroaches to try um to stop on the cockroaches is to shine the light on them. And they, but they get mm -hmm. all scared and try to hide run back into the dark, but I mean, we're shining the light on them. Um Yeah. Where and the last thing too is like uh recently um I decided to sort of call the NSA out, you know, and, and let them know like I am sick and tired of this. Like I I I you know, this is ruined my life, like just leave me alone. And so what I did was the general and the the director of the NSA is now a Japanese guy named Paul M. Nakasone. And he's Okinawan. I'm two percent Okinawan. Um and 48% Japanese and, you know, mixed with all this other stuff. And uh, so I can't speak Japanese anymore, but I use Google Translate. And I wrote him a letter and then I flipped it from English to Japanese. And then uh, I looked, I Googled the NSA and they had their, you know, website at 9800 North Savage Road, Fort Me, Maryland, 20755. And they had reviews. So I left them a Google review. And I, and I, I, I confronted them about everything about my ex-husband. And then I uploaded about 27 pictures of all of his, you know, the, the, the text messages of him planning my murder and, you know, me getting stabbed and, and my stuff being missing and getting stuff back and just the investigation that they said he was under. And then all of a sudden it disappeared. I mean, I laid it all out. The next day, the whole thing was gone. Their entire website was gone off of Google. Obviously, they read it. <laughs> wow. It was crazy. I was like, wow. I can't believe Like, I just thought of it. Like, I saw the website and I saw the reviews. And people were like, oh, like, the NSA is such a good agency. And I was like, no, it's not. Like, what are you talking about? Like, who paid for these reviews? And so I put it on there. And then the next day, it changed. And it said that the NSA was in California. But I know they have a site in Seattle, Washington. And that gang stalking video about Seattle and how what they're doing to the homeless there and everything else. It's un I mean, I believe it. I believe it. I've seen I've seen vans pull up and pull put homeless people in there from, from York City, Pennsylvania, and you wonder where they go. And the homeless, they call them the jumpers because they're literally like paramilitary people that grab people off the street like the Gestapo, you know, and, and it's scary. And then they disappear. And, and I just saw something on the news um, recently. Well, it wasn't the news news. It was like InfoWars. But uh, this guy was interviewing somebody in, I think it was El Paso, Texas, where they had set up all these illegal immigrants and tents and stuff on, this, on you know, some road, some main road in El Paso. And then by the next day, they were all gone. And they're like, where did they go? Or what about the all the illegals missing that they were put in, you know, somewhere yeah, in New York City? Yeah, there's a lot of like, human trafficking going on. It's mm -hmm. human trafficking, sending them to space, probably sending them to be eaten by ET, uh, sex trafficking, um, mm -hmm. all sorts of stuff is probably going on with that. I mean, I'm not going to claim anything as fact, but I know. Or even the FEMA camps. And, you yeah. know, I mean, they, they if I had lived during World War II, I would have been in an internment camp. Because I'm Japanese American. I would have been in, in a concentration camp here. In, yeah. in, you know what I mean? Yeah, people don't and they, and, they, and they say, you know, our history, like when I went to high school and I graduated in the 80s, they never taught us about the internment camps. I never even heard not. of this. No, of I didn't not. hear about it until George George H.W. Bush was like paying back reparations to the Japanese American. There was only they like a few left because they're all people dead. Like when you talk about the racial history of America, they call it critical race theory. It's Yeah. <laughs> it's just and, our um, history. We have, a lot of, we have some, some history that's not so savory when it comes to the way we've treated ethnic peoples it's the whole like you said what, what do your dad call yours the wasps wasps that's white anglo-saxon protestant yeah those so are that's the, the who... elitist the freemasons you know and my dad was a freemason my and an odd fellow an odd fellow yep. is, is a similar you know organization and um i actually have the piece of the crazy quilt my grandmother made with a ribbon. It was red in, with gold letters that said Off Fellow Home, Worcester Mass, 1896. And it belonged to my grand, my great grandfather. So there is that connection there. And then my ex-boyfriend, one time um, I came over his house, we just started dating and I saw 
this very unusual pin sitting on his bureau. And I'm like, wait, that's my pin. Where'd you get that? I go, that belonged to my father. He goes, no, this is my grandfather's pin. He was a Freemason. I'll go, okay, but my dad had that pin. And then I thought he stole it somehow, but I was like, well, how did he get it out of my house? And it turned out they had the same pin. Yeah. And his, his grandfather was a high ranking Freemason. His grandmother was an Eastern star. And so was my grandmother. That's the 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 sorority of the of the Freemasons, and then the Odd Fellows. They're called the Rebecca's. The girl, the women are called the Rebecca's. Um, and so my family on on my dad's side of the family, they were all involved in that kind of thing. And as far as me, um, my my dad, even though he was married to two Japanese women, I remember my father saying to my mother in, in arguments like, oh, my, my, my mother would be rolling over in her grave if she knew I married a Japanese. Well, she didn't, he didn't say Japanese, but you know, he used a derogatory term for a Japanese person. And, uh, there was a lot of racial, you know, arguments about her being Japanese. And we got blamed for Pearl Harbor everywhere we went. I wasn't invited to birthday parties because my mom was Japanese and I was from Japan and they blamed Pearl Harbor on us. And, you know, it, it's just, I didn't have, I didn't have, I was bullied all through school. I was the only non-white person in my school, but my sister had like blondish hair. So she fit in. I was always like the, the, you know, the outcast. So I started getting into punk rock music and rebelling and, and, and I had a mohawk and I dressed all in black and I was just like, F everybody. Like, I don't care. You know, I started running away from home to escape the abuse. Very and, common, um, very common with us assets. Yeah. Very common story. I was, I also had like, was super into like the punk rock scene for a long time. Mm -hmm. Um, we're, we're on over two hours now and I got to get okay. going with me soon. <laughs> it was great. I mean, I, I love longer interviews. Um, and I know that it, I, you know, you have a lot of important information, so, um, I appreciate you, you coming on and giving your testimony. It was powerful. I hope it helps people. I believe it will. Um, is there anything you want to say before I wrap things up? Well, I know this has been a long time coming because we've tried to like get together and then we had a little bit of issues with the, you know, the video and all that. But, you know, I'm, I'm super glad that we did this. Um, I didn't know what to expect. I mean, I, I, I just never know, you know, going into an interview blind, you know, just what, what's going to what's going to happen. Um, you know, what are we going to talk about? And I just let it sort of, you know, flow. And, and um, you did a great job. And, well, thank you. I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you for having me on your show. And uh, I look forward to, you know, seeing what people say, you know. Yeah, there's going to, when it premieres, there'll be a, like a conversation, a live chat. So if you want to come oh, okay. for that, I think it'll be, I just did an interview with Brian too. I might, I might upload your video first because I don't have to edit yours. I have to edit the one with Brian. We just, it was, <laughs> I just don't want to get any strikes from YouTube. But um, right. yeah, so I'm just going to edit out a few parts where I feel like YouTube might. But yeah, so maybe I'll put up yours first. I'll let you know when, I, when, when it gets put up, though, so you can be a part of the live chat if you want, because people might have questions for you and stuff. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be but, a good idea. But, yeah, you don't have to do it, but um, you always it's always an option. And, you know, you, you can, you know, answer questions. And there might be people who might even have information for you based on your mm -hmm. testimony, stuff that they've experienced it's similar stuff like that. So it's always, I, I feel like the live chat is always a, a good place. Um, but yeah, yeah I um, mean, I think it is good to talk to not just other TIs, but just, you know, like I have somebody I'm doing an interview with next week and he just recently discovered that he's a targeted individual and he's retired and he's written several books uh, about ETs and uh, things like that. And he, and, you know, he's been telling me that he's been attacked with energy weapons and, you know, things, you know, that are common, like being followed and, you know, things like that. And it's just very unnerving that, you know, it's like, we're trying to, tell people what's really going on and there, this, it's happening to enough people and it isn't just like ghibli gook like people rambling like ah, i'm being followed like no there's like all this yeah, yeah, yeah. like there's right. all this evidence that this technology exists it's real they can rate microwave weapons are real uh all this you know um 
they have they have and like i said what they're doing is they're trying to create this this military apparatus that will control the population and they're testing it on people that's what i believe a lot of it is because people are like well why would they do this why would they target people like this it's to, to neutralize them to make them not a threat so they're not out there doing productive things you know helping their community um or just just in general it doesn't have even have to be um like activists it doesn't even have to be thank you it doesn't even have to be like being an activist they just don't want certain people out there putting their energy out there for whatever reason and they'll mm -hmm. target those people and um yeah i just think you're great for coming on the show because not everybody that has experienced this stuff can speak so eloquently and put it in a way from the ground up or like make it people see like this is a real thing so that's mm -hmm. hugely powerful i hope that it helps a lot of other people who are also ti's dealing with this and um yeah thank you so much for coming on the show we are the disclosure. We are the disclosure. Thank you for watching. Everybody who's tuned in and listening, for everyone's listening. Um, mm -hmm. This has been Emmy Lee. Um, do you, if people want to get a hold of you, is there any way that should I leave something in the description or or would you rather? Well, um, would you rather not? Well, I have my Facebook of? page, Emmy Lee Frost. Okay. Um, other than that, you know, a lot of my accounts have been shut down. Um, I've had several interviews on YouTube from Dan Hen and a 9-11 truther, and both of those were scrubbed, and I believe he was kicked off of, of uh, YouTube. So um, my other interviews, they can look up Emily Frost uh, Schaefer. It's E-M-I-L-E-E -E -E Frost, F-R-O-S-T hyphen S-H-A-E-F-E-R. Um, I've used multiple aliases for, you know, different things just to not embarrass, you know, my children or other people in my family that don't like it, like me talking about it, even though... They deep down inside, they know the truth. Yeah, they know but as well. They just don't want to accept know. it. Well, exactly. we are the disclosure. Thank you, Emmy. Thank you for everybody watching. Thank you.